perhaps we asked the wrong question um, and we're taught to ask the wrong question uh, through life. Uh, we often ask questions like, what do you want to do when you grow up? Or what are you good at? What are you good at? And, and we ask that to ourselves. What am I good at? Where is my strength? We work in an upside down kingdom. We're part of a kingdom that is upside down. It's, it doesn't make sense, this kingdom. And so maybe we ask the wrong question when we come to working out what it is that we should be doing in God, what it is that we should be doing in the community, what it is that we should be should doing with our friends, our neighbours, our family. So, because, the next slide, thanks, Michael. I call this message unexpectedly empowered. And because I think we often ask the wrong question. And we've been, like I say, we've been trained to ask, ask it, right from being little kids. Next question. See, we live in an upside down kingdom where the first will be the last and the last will be the first. That's a bit trippy. The poor are rich. To find your life, you must lose it. The greatest is the servant of all. Maturity is being childlike. Unless you come like, become like a child, like, like a child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He's not being childish. You can't get away with that. The weak are chosen above the strong. We do not walk by sight, yet we have good eyes. Mary said, she blesses the angel, says you have... Give, filled the hungry with good things, but you've sent away the rich empty-handed. It's an upside-down kingdom. The next slide, thanks, Michael. Ah, oh, here it is. You're, you're leading the way. So in this kingdom, barrenness is no barrier. You have a look down through the, the significant men and women of God, how many of their parents were the barren, Many of them. Many of them. It was, it's almost like a prerequisite. Let's find a couple that can't have a child and let's bring a world changer out of their womb or out of her womb, out of his body. But there are other barrennesses that we have. We sometimes feel fruitless in certain parts of our lives. We feel like, I don't make a difference in this area. Maybe that's actually your calling. Maybe that empty place that you have in your life that has seemed never to have borne fruit is actually what you're meant to be doing. Maybe the thing you were the most scared of doing. Pick me, public speaking. Prophecy. Is actually your destiny. Colour, gender or race does not disqualify. That's, that's pretty well a no-brainer. Size doesn't count. Numbers do not matter. Illegitimacy does not equal rejection. Our saviour was illegitimate. He had a stepfather. Whatever way you look at it, he was illegitimate. So he carries a curse so the curse is broken for us. So poor education levels do not limit or are no limiter. The past does not determine your future. And weakness doesn't discount. These things are true. And we either live on the edge of this wonder or we, we retract or we, we pull back to where we know safe. And the one, one of the things I love about this community and particularly many of the people that I meet here, that you're willing to go up to that edge. The next slide, thanks, Michael. Here's Paul 
struggling with a weakness, and we don't know what it is. It could be anything. But he prays three times to Jesus about this thing. I don't know if that's a magic number or anything, but he gives up after three, obviously because Jesus speaks to him. But And it says that Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness, or for power is perfected in weakness. So there is one place that Jesus Christ has promised to make perfect his power. And it's in our weakness. Funny. I didn't see that one coming. There's a reason for that, because then he can get all the glory. I would say to people, speaking is not my strength. Prophecy is not my strength. It's my weakness. I have to lean in. I have to lean on. I have to trust him. I have to seek him. And then Paul goes on to say, Most gladly, therefore, I'll boast about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Now, I've been to lots of different churches, lots of different facilities, lots of amazing complexes, and been in the offices of the leaders or the general manager and seen the certificates on the wall and the the great achievements that the church has done and the photographs with the Prime Minister and, and the leaders of the country shaking hands, big checks, all sorts of things. But on Paul's wall, I wonder whether or not we would have had uh, lots of different certificates. I think he would have had his weaknesses. Because he said, Most gladly, therefore, I'll boast about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. I think we asked the wrong question. Not what am I good at, not what are my, what are my strengths, but maybe what are my weaknesses? Because it's in those places we see miracles. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't do things because you've got abilities or gifts. You don't want somebody who can't play the guitar trying to lead worship. That's just stupid. But if you feel like called cool to play the guitar, learn. You can, nobody's born being able to play the guitar. It takes, takes, takes discipline, takes lessons, takes, takes training, takes, takes commitment. But don't let a feeling of a sense of weakness in any area in your life keep you from pursuing that, hoping for that, longing for that, knocking on that door. Remember, knock and it shall be open to you. You only knock on closed doors. So don't, don't kind of shrink away from a closed door thing. Oh, wrong place. Door wasn't open. I shouldn't be here. Knock on that thing. Don't kick it down. You shouldn't open what shouldn't be opened. But definitely knock. So we will see many times in Scripture that power is perfected in weakness over and over and over again. So if I can encourage you, and I, I should have done this, and Michael's about to do it. He's about to type up the word impossible in big, big letters all together as one word, and then we're going we're gonna to play with it a little bit. The word impossible, once he gets it up there, he's, he's working. I'm making him work this trip, aren't I? Thank you, Michael. But see, see, sometimes we shrink away from a situation because we think, well, it's not, it's not, I'm not good at that. I can't do that. Maybe we're this close. We're a breath away from seeing God do a miracle. Maybe we're a breath away from a second away, a moment away from seeing God break through, but we shrink back and think, no, 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 no. No, I, I, I can't, I can't, um, I, I can't prophesy for somebody get Tony Saxon to do that. Well, Tony Saxon isn't here. Well, he is now, of course. But I used to think this all the time with people. I used to think, oh, I wish, I wish the pastor was here. They're not, then they would know what to do. Well, the pastor isn't there. The person with the gift isn't there. But the person who is the gift is. 
You, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You carry him with you. So the impossible, the word impossible can be seen different ways. It can be seen like that. But this is what I think how it works, and this is how I try and treat it. If you were to put now uh, an apostrophe between the I and the M and split the M from the word possible, we have a different word altogether. I'm possible, of course. Look at that. This is the realm that God moves in. God has his most fun in the realm of the impossible. So don't shrink back from the impossible. Don't shrink back from a sense of weakness at a moment. Don't shrink back from something where you feel like we can't do this. Step forward. Say, come on, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's have a crack at it. Because it's the one place that he's promised to make perfect his power is in our weaknesses. When I am weak, then I am strong. Let's accept the truth of his word. Without him, we can do nothing. John, Jesus speaking. Paul says, but with him we can do all things. The Bible's a book of balance. So keep the balance in place. Don't shrink away from the impossible. You've got this land next door, amazing. There would have been times when that seemed impossible. You got this mad Kiwi four or five years ago saying, it's yours. Knew it was for you. This community is part of something that God is doing globally. We are living in remarkably important times. We are on the brink, on the threshold, and probably through the threshold now, of a move of God that I don't really know, I don't know how to describe it. I know that the Catholic Church and the Catholic Renewal Church has a big significant part to play. You have networks in nations and in countries and, oh, same thing, in nations and in communities that no one else has. I remember when I first became a Christian in 1984, I, beca I became a Christian, then I became a Pentecostal. And what was a common thing then was the, the study of the book of Revelation. And obviously the mark of the beast comes up and the Antichrist. And of course, at my first encounter of this, I hear that the mark of the beast and the Antichrist is the Pope and it's the Catholic Church. <laughs> Confusing. When, when Christine and I got married, we went to a conference in Christchurch and the guest speaker was a man called Derek Prince. He, he's gone now, he, he died. It's not his fault. It, we all will die sooner or later. He lived a great life. Fantastic Bible teacher. His opening address, but two, two, maybe two, two and a half thousand people there. His opening address was, I understand that I'm, you know, I don't know, I can't do his, I wish I could copy his talk, get all full of sleep though, if, you did, if it did. He said, I, under, I know this is a Pentecostal gathering of Pentecostal pastors and leaders and Pentecostal members of Pentecostal churches. And I understand that. I know that you love the Holy Spirit. You like to move in signs and wonders and, some, and we will see some tonight with confidence. And we did. He said, however, I must address you with a warning. And I thought, this is interesting. He said, unless you change your position on the Catholic Church, you are at risk of being judged by God. There is no other denomination that's defended the virgin birth, the, the divinity of Christ, some of the great tenets of our faith, like the Catholic Church. No one has. Many of them have slipped. Now, he was saying this in 1984. Look what's happened since. Almost everything's up for grabs. But, but, but the Catholic Church has remained, held that ground. 
we will not change from this position. And, and again, kudos. Amazing, remarkable. So it feels like God has positioned and there's been a remnant within the Catholic Church that have held on to the, to the, to the tenets of faith. They've, some people have died for these things. They've laid their lives down, been martyred just because they held on to these things. So you guys are part of something very significant. We are living in days, we're about, we're about to see a move of God. We are starting to see a move of God. It's begun. I tell a story a little bit. I probably told, told, told it uh, when I first came here last year. But you had the speaker here, Joel Milgate, came a couple of years ago. I gave him a word at his church when it was 90 people and said, you're, you're about to be a sign and a wonder to this nation and to the world. People around the world will find out about this because God's going to do something here that's a first fruit. It's just a given, it's like fruit from the promised land. It's to encourage us. This is where it goes. As I said, I spoke at his church two, two or three weeks ago. Over 2,500 people call that place home now, three years later. It's nuts. They're about to plant another church that, that's already, they've got 500 people signed up for it. It hasn't even started yet. It's crazy. So we are seeing revivals happen, or, or I don't know whether revival is the right word, because revival sounds like giving something coming back, being revived. It's like a revival before the re. Um, we, we, we will see God do some amazing things. I work in Cambodia a little bit. Last year I was in Cambodia and I spoke to a guy called Jesse McCaw. I said, in 2011, the Lord gave you a word about having 10,000 people in your church and 500 churches. He opened his diary and said, there it is. He wrote to me recently and they have now 500 churches and they're around that 10,000 mark. They can't train pastors fast enough. Now, we're not going to hear about that on the media. You're just not going to. And so we, we're living in a time where we will see God do amazing things. This place, the servants of Jesus community and the, the Catholic fraternity has a significant part in it in the globe. And so don't, don't ever pull back from the impossible. Don't ever pull back from something you think it's impossible. Will you imagine how many people said when they looked at St. Paul and said, never, never. He'll never bow the knee. Or at St. Peter, a fisherman, really? So God looks for the impossible to show his power and his greatness. So don't pull back. Don't give up. Don't shrink back from it. Jump in. Scream and yell. Get, get busy in that place. I'm good for it. Let's pray. Jesus, um, we are challenged by you because um, everything about you is kind of upside down. You choose the, one of the most insignificant races in a, in a significant part of the world and a, a, in a, an insignificant tribe, just like Gideon, and boom, the world has changed. And we, we, want, we want to notice the insignificant. We want to notice the things that are overlooked because there could be a destiny changer there. So Lord, open our eyes, open the eyes of our heart. And Lord, we also pray that we don't want to shrink back from the impossible because that's where we see your glory come. That's where we see your majesty reign. Get, Lord, I pray for an impartation of faith on the hearts and the spirits of these men and women. Lord, I thank you that the, before me, these men and women, their bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I ask you to come, fill them again. 
Pour out your spirit on them right now. Lord, we breathe you in. His fresh breath. We accept that our bodies are a place you want to live. Fill your house, Lord. Look at your sons and daughters. Look at them now. And we we say, Lord, look what you've done to us. Now look what you've done. You've taken us from sinners and made us saints. You've taken us from the rebellious and made us the people that want to be obedient. So fill these bodies with your spirit so that the world may be changed, so that the kingdom may come, so that your will will may be done. Come, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, also I pray that you release another measure of prophecy. Release a spirit of prophecy over this congregation, these people. Might they take something back from them that both feel like it's within grasp, they can do it. Not because of who they are, but because of who you are. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, so strengthen them. Lord, I pray for a blessing on them. May they know that your hand is upon their shoulder, that your spirit is in their bodies, that you have walked before them, that they'll be blessed in what they do, that you'll arrange them uh, important meetings so that they'll have encounters that have a taste of heaven. Bless them, Jesus. I thank you for the great privilege and the great honour that it is to serve them. And I hope I've done a good job. I hope my work has been good. But Lord, in spite of that, we thank you for the worship that we, in spite of my work, we thank you for the worship that we've enjoyed, the fellowship that we've been enriched by, and just being strengthened by one another's faith. Thanks so much. For this opportunity, Lord, I ask you to bless these people. Bless them good. Make them different. Change the world through them. Cool. Jesus changed the world with 12 teenagers, well, mostly teenagers. We, I've probably said this here before, but what's remarkable is that, and, and I love this about this, this place, the way that you welcome the young people, the way that you, that you want them to serve, that you want them to lead, I think that's fantastic. When I first became a Christian, I was 19, and I was told that I could not be in leadership until I was 40. <laughs> it's twice my age. I thought I'd be dead by then. 40. I thought you have a Zimmer frame at 40, don't you? Seriously, I was. Can't tell you how disappointing that was. Jesus, they, they understand that Jesus chose mostly teenagers to be his first disciples. Peter was the only one that was probably around Jesus' age, 30. He was married. And when he catches the fish for the, the uh, poll tax, you only pay poll tax when you're 30 years old. Jesus said, there's two coins in the mouth for you and for me. The other guys skip because they're not old enough. James and John were still living with their dad, still working with them. The kids, teenagers. Changed the world. Look what you could do with this group. Easy. <laughs>